Welcome back to Microprocessor Architecture and 8086 Programming. We are back to Introduction to Instruction Format. As we know, a computer works by taking input, processing it and producing some meaningful output. Here processing is very important. Why? Because otherwise input would have been output. There is nothing new. All this difference is coming because of this processing. Who is going to do this processing? The processor is going to do the processing. Now, to do this processing, we have to keep our information somewhere, right? Where we, we can keep our information? We can keep the information in CPU registers or in the main memory or in the secondary storage. Each, each location has its own advantage and limitation. For example, CPU registers are very fast, but they are very limited in size. Main memory is quite huge, but it is a bit slower than the CPU register. And the secondary storage, it's very huge, but it is very slow. Considering their advantages and limitation, we have to utilize these different storage areas to make our computations faster and efficient. Now, we know that all these things are going to happen. The processing is going to happen in the processor. But what all operations this processor is going to do? The processor is not going to do anything amazing, anything extraordinary. It is only going to do very small operations, small operations like adding two numbers, subtracting, dividing, multiplying, likewise, or the logic operations such as combining and, oring, or complementing, not operation. There are some more bit level operations like shifting, and also you can transfer from the processor, you can transfer to main memory. From the main memory, you can get back the data to the processor. And you can also take input from the input device or you can give some output. All these things you can do. But you wanted to do something, but how this processor is going to know what operation you want to do? You have to specify them as instructions. You have to give the instruction processor will do that operation. So now you should follow a common, common language, isn't it? The processor knows only machine level language, that is binary language, on, off. And we know many languages, but we have to go down to the level of the processor. We should speak only in a binary language. Again, in the binary language, you can make many sentences. You can have many bit combinations. How you will know? Only this operation has to be executed. How the processor can decide only this operation is the meaning. For that, you have to again stick to some specific format. That format is known as instruction format. In instruction format, you can have, you can have many formats. Again, so how you can have many formats? There are many processors. Each processor can have its own format. And uh, we have our own requirements. Depending upon our requirement, we can change the instruction format. Also, uh, due to the internal structure of the instruction, what is contained in the instruction, instruction format may vary. There, there, there are many more reasons also. So now, instead of studying instruction formats of all the processes, what we can do is we can just stick to our basic computer, the manual machine. In the basic computer, the simplest instruction format is designed in the two byte format. As you can see here, our purpose is just understanding the instruction format. Uh, so in this format, there are two parts, two major divisions. One is operation code. What should be the operation? That is specified by operation code or op code. And the second part is address or the upper end part. You have to do the operation, but on which data or on which location that is specified in the upper end part. So instruction is going to have two parts, operation code and upper end. So which is bigger here? Operation, we have only limited number of operations. Since operation code is a small thing. So operation code has very few a bit. Upper end can be large. 
means we will reserve major portion for the upper end or the address. Now, we have to understand how these uh, upper ends or the instructions are specified. Or uh, we know we can specify in the binary language, but it is quite di difficult. It's quite challenging for a human being to understand individual bits and to specify something as individual bits. It's quite challenging. Or uh, you have to spend more time on this. To reduce our effort, we have come up with one solution. Not we, but the inventors. So these inventors have described you can use hexadecimal values instead of individual bits. Why hexadecimal values? There are 16 different symbols. In 4 bits, how many combinations we can make? 16. So 16 numbers, 16 different combinations. So now we can match for each individual bit combination, we can pick up one hexadecimal number. And hence, we can do these trans translations very easily. How you can see this? So here, we have taken some random bits, 1, 0, 1, 0. So these bits can be converted as one single hexadecimal value. How? You have to assign positional values. You may remember about binary and decimal conversion or binary hexadecimal conversion, vice versa. So the same conversion we are going to do. So now assign positional values. How we are going to assign 2 power 0, 2 power 1, 2 power 2, 2 power 3. Starting from the rightmost, least significant bit, we will go up to the most significant bit. At each individual digit, we will raise the 2 power ones. Now, uh, we have this positional values and individual bits. Now, what to do? We will multiply individual bits and the positional values. How? Like this. 1 into 2 power 3. What is 2 power 3? 8. 1 into 8. And 2 power 2 is 4. 4 into 0. 0 into something which is 0. We will ignore. Anyway. And 2 power 1, that is 2 into 1. And also 2 power 0, that is 1 into 0. Likewise, we will multiply positional values to the individual bits. This will be, uh, after multiplying, we have to sum it up. How we are going to sum it up? 8 plus 0 plus 2 plus 0. This is equivalent to 10 in decimal. So, 1010 in binary is equivalent to 10 in decimal. In decimal, we have only 9 symbols. In hexadecimal, we have 16. Hence, we will convert this to, to the hexadecimal value. In the hexadecimal value, nothing extra. You just need to think. We, ha we, 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 have, to, uh, we have to take the extra symbol. That's all. So, what is the extra symbol? We can count up to 0 to, starting from 0 to 9, we can count. So after 9, instead of 10, we will be taking the A. Then B, C, D, E, F, up to F, we can take in the hexadecimal symbolic list. So hence, 10 will be written as A in hexadecimal. Now, you can do this conversion manually, or you can just make a chart for each individual bit sequence, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 1. So likewise, you can make a chart and you can do the conversion very quickly. So this will be much easier for the human being. So using hexadecimal values. So how do we make the groups in a 16-bit instruction? 16-bit instruction can be divided into 4-bit groups. Nibble. The 16-bit instruction will be divided into 4 different 4-bit groups or 4 different nibbles. So, each nibble is converted to a hexadecimal number. So, entire 16-bit instruction will be converted into just 4 digit. So, instead of providing 16 different values, you can just provide 4 different hexadecimal numbers. This is how we give the instruction. And one more thing, this is 16-bit instruction format. Why it is 16-bit? Because it is easy and it is sufficient for our basic computer. But if you consider any other processor or any other computer, this instruction format will vary. It will vary according to that requirements and the processor capabilities. So, 
here we will stop today's discussion and in the next session we will learn more about registers and instructions thank you happy learning